So welcome everybody. And uh, yeah, we today is still the 25th uh, here. And if you've been reading the paper, I don't know if you get any news about the weather, uh, but we've been having uh, a, a huge storm from last night that's going until Monday. So we're very happy that our electricity is still working and that I can get online <laughs> because uh, the snow is really piling up. So, but we need it after all of the, uh, the very, very hot uh, summer we had. Okay, so uh, in Singapore, I know some of you probably haven't seen snow before. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about um, what is faith this evening, and uh, I usually like to start things by sitting quietly, uh, so we can just take a couple of minutes, breathe, relax the mind, and then set our motivation, and then start the talk. Okay, so sit up straight, lower your eyes. And then come home to your breath. Just let your breathing pattern be quite normal. Don't push it. Don't deep breathe. But be aware of the in-breaths and the out-breaths. And if there's a pause between one and the other. You can focus on your breath by watching your belly rise and fall. Or by placing your attention at the upper lip and the nostrils and feeling the sensation of the air as it passes there. So let's just do this for a few minutes. Let the mind calm down. If you get distracted, don't uh, get mad at yourself. Just come home to the breath, that's all. And then let's generate our motivation. And remember that we're not listening to the Buddha's teachings so that we can become somebody important or impress all of our friends with our knowledge. or even to attain our own awakening. Rather, we're approaching the teachings with a mind of compassion that feels connected to all other living beings and wants to benefit them.
But when we're confused people with ignorance, anger, and attachment, it's difficult for us to benefit anybody. And so that's why we aim for the awakening of a Buddha to transform our mind into a Buddha's mind. So we'll have the wisdom, compassion, and skillful means to know how to benefit each individual according to their own disposition and interests. So set that compassionate altruistic intention of bodhicitta as the reason for us sharing the Dharma today. And slowly open your eyes and come out of your meditation. Okay. So, talking about what is faith, I'm wondering why I chose that title. Because faith is uh, not a topic that, uh, how to say, that comes easily to me. Okay. Now, you would think, oh, but she's been ordained so long. She must have some faith. Well, yeah. Uh, but uh, the history of how I generated faith is... is uh, it's a little bumpy here and there. So it's uh, interesting for me to, to be able to talk about that. And I'll share a little bit of my own experience here. Um, so some of you are from Buddhist families. Yeah, and you grew up maybe going to the temple with your grandmother or your mother. Uh, you have the Buddhist holidays, you know what they are, you know, in Singapore, you even get a day off for Vesak. Yeah. And uh, you have lots of friends that are Buddhist and, you know, people where you live know what Buddhism is. Well, I grew up in the U.S., which is not a Buddhist country. And uh, people really did not know much about Buddhism when I was little. They knew that it was a world religion, but it was practiced a long ways away across the ocean. Yeah. And they had statues. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when we went to Thai restaurants, they had a statue of a Buddha with a big belly. Yeah. So that was kind of the extent of uh, what we knew about Buddhism, you know, a little bit from school. And then, of course, the uh, uh, Maitreya depicted as the, uh, the very chubby Buddha. So when we talk about having faith, yeah, there's different kinds of faith. And one of the uh, kinds of faith is called <clears throat> um, admiring faith. And this is where you know the qualities of the Buddha, you admire the qualities, and that uh, because you know those qualities and admire them, then that generates a very happy, joyful, receptive mind which is what faith is. So when you grow up in a Buddhist culture, uh, then it's not too difficult to have that faith. And you can ask people around you, um, you know, to explain different things to you. 
there is there could be a tendency though to uh, to what we call blind faith, which is not the kind of faith that we're trying to develop as Buddhists. Um, blind faith is more just, well, I don't really understand it, but yeah, sure, I believe. Uh, but that's not very stable and it's not founded on anything reliable. But, okay, so I grew up in that kind of context. Uh, I, had, I studied science a lot when I was younger. And so I grew up with a lot of questions. And uh, I was raised one religion and I asked questions. I wanted to understand how the world came about and the purpose of my life. But the answers that people gave didn't make any sense to me. So I started inquiring about other religions. And then eventually, when I was 24, I encountered um, my teachers. Yeah. But even then, it was uh, like, well, what does it mean to have faith? I'm taking refuge. But what does refuge mean? You know, and who is Buddha? And okay, you get the Lamrim text. I'm sure some of you have been studying Lamrim. And they have many descriptions of all the qualities of the Buddha. And they're fantastic qualities. And that for me was part of the problem, was they were so fantastic that how could I believe they existed? Yeah, somebody has omniscient mind and they know everything. Well, how in the world is that possible? Yeah, somebody has compassion for all living beings, no matter whether they help him or harm him. Really? Is that possible? You know, somebody can make manifestations and send them into the different realms of existence to benefit sentient beings. Huh? You know, I had never heard of these kinds of things before. So I had a lot of doubt. Okay. But, yeah, what really uh, kept me learning was that some of the things I did learn made complete sense to me. Yeah, so that leads to a second kind of faith, which is called convictional faith. So this is a feeling of trust or confidence in the triple gem that comes about because you know something about them. Yeah, and you've thought about the teachings. So that, you know, was was some the way I went, okay? I couldn't just believe that didn't work for me. So my way was through study. But I was practicing in Asia with a lot of Westerners and a lot of Tibetans and, you know, many people uh, who had this incredible faith in the three jewels. And especially some of my Western friends, it was just like, oh, our teacher's a Buddha. Oh, my goodness, he's a Buddha. And, uh, you know, the three jewels, this is fantastic. And they're like overflowing with this pat, completely passionate faith in, in Buddha Dharma Sangha and and wanting to give everything and give their whole lives to, to the Dharma. And I'm going, mm -hmm. maybe something's wrong with me because I don't feel that way. Yeah, I must, I just don't have much faith. And I was comparing myself to these other people and of course, as soon as we compare ourselves to others, we always come out on the losing side. 
Although sometimes we come out on the better side and then we get arrogant, but very often we come out on the losing side. And that's what I did. And so, you know, all the other people I'm practicing with who are, are ordained like me, they have so much faith, so much confidence. They trust the teacher so much. They trust. And I'm like, mm, okay, let's go slowly and think about things here. And I just felt like, uh, you know, really like something was wrong with me that I wasn't like them. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump to the conclusion of this story and then come back to how I got there. Many years later, so what I was just telling you was at, at the beginning when I met the Dharma, I, I encountered the Dharma in 1975, okay? So the first good years, a long time I felt like that actually. And now when I look around at the people that I started out with, my cohort when uh, I started studying, some of those people aren't here anymore. Yeah, I don't know. Some of them disrobed, some of them left to do, I don't know what they're doing. And it was very surprising to me to see that after all these years, all those people who had so much faith, some of them were still here, but some of them had vanished. But I was still here. And I'm going, how did that happen? I was the one without any faith. And they're the ones with faith. But I'm here and they're not. Okay, so the moral of this part of the story is don't compare yourself to others. Okay, it doesn't work. It is not beneficial. And you often come up with totally the wrong conclusion. Okay, so that's kind of what happened to me. So I still didn't think I had a lot of faith. But I did know I had to realize, well, I must have some because I'm still coming to teachings. And I've been ordained almost 45 years. So there, there, there must be, yeah? But I still feel like it's not so much compared to other people. Okay, let's come back. And I wanna talk about the three kinds of faith and then maybe share a little bit about how I got from where I started to where I am now uh, in an attempt to give you some ideas about what faith is and how to go about increasing it, because it is one of the 11 virtuous mental factors. When you study mind and mental factors, it's one of the 11 virtuous ones, okay? First, before I get into describing faith in more detail, faith is not a very good translation of the, the Tibetan word depa, okay? It is not, it's a, faith is a horrible translation actually, because so often when we think of faith, we think of blind faith, yeah? It's like, oh, everything looks kind of majestic. Yes, I believe, I believe, uh, because everybody else believes and uh, they want me to believe, so yes, I believe. Yeah, uh, so that's blind faith. Yeah, that's, that's not really very useful. But that's what we often think of as faith. That's not what faith is according to Buddhism, okay? I think, I, I haven't come up with a good translation term for, for depa, the Tibetan term, but it has to do, it's kind of a cross between confidence and trust with a little bit of faith um, mixed in, okay? So we have confidence 
in the Buddha Dharma Sangha. Yeah. We have confidence that they are a reliable refuge and that they can guide us out of samsara and to Buddhahood. We trust them. Yeah, we trust that they have our best interest at, at heart, that they know what they're talking about and they have compassion and they're, they genuinely want to help. So you see how, how faith is not such a good word. It's, it's trust, it's confidence, it's, um, let me read you the definition. This may help a little bit to understand what it is. So this is the definition from Lowrig. Okay, so it's a distinct mental factor that when referring to things such as the law of cause and effect, the law of karma, uh, referring to the three jewels and, or, and so forth, it produces a joyous state of mind free from the turmoil of the root and secondary afflictions. Okay, so faith is a joyous state of mind that is free from the distorted awarenesses that are afflictions. Okay, so that means that faith is, has, is seeing its object, you know, in a correct way. It may not be, we may not have a totally correct way because it's something that grows and we build up over time, okay? Uh, but it's what this joyous mind is, is, it has some substance to it. It's not just like, oh, it makes me feel good, uh, yeah, kind of thing. So uh, faith acts as a basis for generating aspiration for virtuous qualities that haven't yet been generated. So this is how it functions, you know? It, it, it helps us get interested in improving ourselves and generating some good qualities. And it also is a basis for aspi aspiring um, to increase any set, any good qualities that we've already generated. And it's uh, the doorway through which all positive qualities manifest. Hmm, all positive qualities. That's interesting. Okay, so its opposite is faithlessness, or maybe uh, what we could call skepticism, or even the wrong kind of faith, that the blind faith, okay? So the Buddha said that just as a burnt seed is unable to produce a spout, sprout, likewise, a mind devoid of faith is unable to cultivate anything virtuous. Oh, that means faith is really important, okay? Confidence, trust, yeah. It's the basis that is gonna enable us to stay with our practice of abandoning negativities and cultivating good qualities. Yeah, we need something that is the basis that will help us to do that. Okay, so it doesn't mean just having a reverent object before, a reverent attitude before a holy object, okay? But it's a mental factor that has confidence in the teachings, confidence in the teachers, confidence in the three jewels. And that confidence makes us want to follow their advice. Okay, so here you can see why faith or confidence is important to generate good qualities. Because if we don't have that basis, that 
makes us want to learn and follow the, the instructions from the three jewels and from our teachers, then we're not going to follow the instructions and we're not going to develop any good qualities. Okay. And yet, faith is not something that we can tell ourselves we should have. Okay. Because this is what I tried to do when I was comparing myself to my Dharma friends, is like, I should have faith. I should have faith. But I didn't. You know, and I can't make myself. So one of the, the qualities that I've discovered in the Buddha's teachings is that so, so many things that I heard uh, as a child that uh, we should try and do, like love everybody. Um, what's the golden rule? Love. Uh, Treat everybody the way you want to be treated. And, you know, it's holiday season. So, uh, yes, may everybody uh, have peace on earth. Yeah. And goodwill. But I didn't see people who did that. And there was no example. And people just said, you should be like this. But shoulds don't work very much, for at least for me. And I think for a lot of people. Yeah, we can't should ourselves in life. Yeah, we, we have to put our energy into creating the kind of qualities that we want to have. Okay. So that's a, a little bit about what, um, what faith is in general. Yeah, there's three kinds of faith. Yeah, the one that uh, I, I described before was admiring faith, where you know the qualities of the three jewels, and then you admire them. So that's a, a good start, you know, the ability to recognize others' good qualities and respect them and admire them. Then you, based on that, then you can develop aspiring faith. And aspiring faith doesn't just admire the good qualities, but it aspires to generate them ourselves. Okay, so we're getting a little bit more involved. Yeah, the, uh, the, the admiring faith is Buddha, 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 he must be great. Uh, okay, let's do something else. Um, then aspiring faith is Oh, yeah, those qualities sound good. I would like to be like that. But, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I would be like to be, but, but how do I do that? Then the third kind of faith is convictional faith. And this is faith that comes from learning the teachings, thinking about them, meditating on them, so that you really understand them. And that brings in your heart a, a, a kind of certitude, a kind of firmness that you understand. Uh, you know, you don't just hear, oh, the Buddha is wonderful and he can manifest all sorts of bodies. But you, you hear about the path that the Buddha practiced and you begin to get a sense of how maybe you can do something similar that is possible to become like that. Yeah. Or we develop uh, faith in uh, karma, the law of karma and its effects by really thinking about it, studying the texts about karma, and then thinking, making examples in our own life of what kind of causes lead to what kind of effects in our own life and what circumstance we have now came from what kind of causes. Yeah. So you, you study the, the long room texts on karma, you study uh, the wheel of sharp weapons. Yeah. And then you think about these things and that helps you develop faith in karma. Okay. And then, uh, you know, to have faith in the three jewels, 
we really have to understand uh, the path that they followed and how it is possible for us to, to follow that kind of path. And that will lead us into more the convictional faith that's based on understanding. Okay, so let me uh, so uh, make a few examples of, of how I did this, which of course, at the beginning of my practice, I did not think, okay, I'm going to do this and then this and this and this. I, you know, I didn't do that. It's only now, looking back, I see uh, kind of the, the way I grew. But at the time, it was not something I planned on, okay? But at the very first teachings that I went to, yeah, taught by uh, Lama Yeshi and Zopa Rinpoche, one of the things that really impressed me when they talk about Buddhism was they said at the beginning of the course, you don't need to believe anything we say. I said, oh, good. Now I'll listen. Because I've had so many people tell me the truth with a capital T and what they tell me is hogwash. So I'm not going to believe that. But they said, you are intelligent people. You listen. You think about it. If it makes sense to you, practice it. If it doesn't make sense to you, leave it. I thought, I can do that. Yeah, that makes sense. Nobody is pressuring me to be something I am not and to believe something I don't. So, okay, that opens my mind. I can listen. And then as I listened uh, to the teachings, it wound up to, to be a three-week course. There were some things, I, I came back from that, and I, I did a short retreat, and then I, you know, uh, I was a teacher, so I didn't have to work during summer vacation. So I started meditating a lot on the teachings that I received during that course. And what, came, what became apparent were there were a few things that the Lama said that really went into my heart very deeply that I could not deny. Okay, so what were they? Well, first, I went into the Dharma, my first course, thinking that I'm a pretty smart person. Yeah, and uh, I'm a pretty nice person. You know, I, I could improve, but you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person and uh, kind of smart. And yeah, that, that was my, my, you know, how I thought of myself. And then the Lama started talking about the afflictions. And they talked about ignorance, anger, and attachment, the three poisonous minds. And I went, Oh, I have those. Yeah. Oh, maybe I'm not such a great person like I thought I was. Hmm. And it, and the way they explained how the three poisonous minds work and the faults and the problems that they bring in our life, when I started looking at my own life, it was like what they said was true. My goodness, when I acted out of attachment, which I had plenty of, I made a lot of messes. Yeah, when I acted out of anger, I made uh, created a lot of problems. And then when they got, when the Lama started talking about bodhicitta, 
which sounded great, and the impediment to bodhicitta being the self-centered mind. And I started doing some meditation, uh, examining, you know, do, do I have this self-centered mind? It was actually quite shocking <laughs> how self-centered I was. I had no idea. And I had no idea how disadvantageous it was to be so self-centered. So these things were like a boing, a big slap in the face to me. But it was very good because it woke me up. And I realized, oh, you know, actually, I'm really not such a nice person. And I, there are some things that I need to grow and I need to change. Okay. When they talked about rebirth and karma, that's made a lot of sense to me the more I thought about it. Okay. Because it started answering many of the questions I had. Uh, but when, in the discussion of karma, they talked about uh, the ten non, the ten paths of not pathways of non-virtue, yeah, you remember those? Yeah, starting with killing, ending with uh, wrong views. Well, when I started looking at my own mind, I realized I have done all ten. I hadn't even missed one. I had done all 10 many times, not just once or twice, but many times. And that I had created a lot of negative karma motivated by my self-centered mind, putting these seeds that will bring pain in my own mind stream. And it was like, oh, Again, you know, these things that I could not deny. Yeah, I couldn't deny that I had ignorance, anger, and attachment. It was there. I saw it. I couldn't deny my self-centeredness. I couldn't deny my lack of ethical conduct. Okay. And what I also had to acknowledge was how hypocritical I was about all of that thinking I don't have a problem with anger, but all the people who get mad at me, they have a problem with anger. Yeah. They should change their anger. They're exaggerating negativities, not me. They are. I thought until I started looking deeper. And then discovered, oh, lo and behold, this is what I'm doing. Okay. And I was also the hypocrisy came in terms of when I saw uh, government leaders, politicians, or uh, business CEOs, and I'd go, those people, they just lie. Yeah, I mean, that's how they have so much money. They're cheating people. They're lying. Politicians, they're all a bunch of crooks. This was the days of the Vietnam War. They're lying to us about the war. They're not being honest with us. Yeah, and that, that was true. They were lying to us. Yeah. But, you know, these people are bad. They're so corrupt. And then I, I started realizing, oh, uh, when they lie, it's bad. But when I lie, there's a good reason for it. Yeah. Uh, usually I'm trying uh, to, to not hurt anybody else's feelings. So actually I lie out of compassion. It sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Good way to rationalize all my lying. I lie out of compassion so other people aren't hurt. Actually, 
what I had to realize was I lie because I'm covering up things that I did that were selfish that I don't want anybody else to know about because then they won't like me and then they'll be mad at me. Oh, so I'm criticizing, I'm critical of the politicians and the, the CEOs, uh, but I think that I'm uh, a very ethical person. Uh, who are you trying to fool, children? Yeah, I would say to myself, this, it, no, this argument is not correct. Okay, so my beginning stages of developing faith in the Buddha Dharma Sangha and faith and trust in my teachers was realizing that these very basic teachings that the Buddha gave about the mind and about ethical conduct are completely true. And there was no way my mind could wiggle its way out of that to say, I'm such a wonderful, great person, you know, like the, the rationalization has to stop now. So that was actually looking honestly at myself in that way was actually my first step in generating faith in the, in the three jewels. Because I realized that these teachings are completely true. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, so that was how my faith started to develop. And I always recommend to people, find out what it is that really uh, grabbed you about Buddha Dharma when you started studying it whether you grew up as a Buddhist or not, you know, what really went in your heart in such a way that you could not deny it and know what that thing is. Because later, if you begin to have doubts or questions, you always go back to that thing that you know is completely true in what the Buddha said. Yeah. And you anchor yourself in that. And when you can anchor yourself in something like that, it really, it, when you get confused, it gives you a base, an anchor to come back to, to stop the confusion. Okay. But then, okay, so that was enough faith that get, got me interested and got me to, to go to India and started studying more and everything. But then the big question that came was, how do I know the Buddha exists? Yeah, they talk about the Buddha. But, you know, I... I I grew up in a Judaic Christian tradition. They talked about God, but I didn't believe in God. It was, it didn't make any sense. So they're talking about Buddha, you know, just because people talk about Buddha and have faith in Buddha, how do I know he exists? Okay, and this was like a big question mark for me. You know, really, like, how do I know? the Buddha exists. And that, that was a difficult one. Yeah, that was a difficult one. Because how do I know the Buddha exists is, is linked in to another question, which is how do I know that enlightenment is possible? Yeah. They talk about enlightenment this, enlightenment that. How do I know it is possible? Because I was very far from awakening. And how do I get from this 
to full awakening, to full enlightenment. Is it really possible? Yeah. And that's one I couldn't just say, yeah, yeah, I believe. I mean, I kind of did because on the basis of the, the first things that I said about, you know, the importance of ethical conduct and admitting my faults to myself. But this, this was a different kind of doubt. So what really uh, enabled me to clarify this was uh, one of the teachings that His Holiness the Dalai Lama gives. And he said that the mind's nature is, yeah, the mind by definition, by definition is uh, that which is clear and cognizant. So clear in the sense of being for not being formed, not made of atoms and molecules, and also clear in the sense of being able to reflect objects. And the mind is also cognizant in the sense of being able to engage or apprehend objects. And so Soli was saying that just by the definition of what, what mind or consciousness is, it has the quality to know and apprehend objects. That is its very nature, okay? And that the mind itself, you know, when you got down to the basics, it had a lot of obs obscurations covering that ability to know objects. But those uh, obscurations were not the same nature of mind because mind was just that which is clear and cognizant. Okay. And then His Holiness set, started going into, you know, okay, the mind has this natural ability to cognize objects, but there are certain factors that prevent us from cognizing objects. So, for example, uh, there's a wall in front of me. I can't see on the other side of the wall. Okay, so that impedes me from knowing what's on the other side of the wall. Um, some objects are very far away, so my senses can't perceive them. They don't know that they're there because they're too far away. Okay. So there's those kind of impediments to, to knowing certain things, you know, and we all know that there's certain sounds that we can't hear, again, because our audio faculty can't pick them up, but cats and dogs and birds hear those sounds, even though we can't, okay? So there's something also with our sense powers that prevents us from knowing objects. But then, okay, so that made a lot of sense. But then His Holiness continued and he said, but also there's obscuration on our mind, our mental consciousness as well, you know, and what's that obscuration? Some of it is karmic obscuration, you know, the, the seeds from the, non-virtuous actions that we've created. And some of it is the obscuration from the afflictions. And by this time, I knew I had afflictions. I couldn't deny that anymore. Okay. And I was beginning to see how the afflictions operated and how they took, how they created uh, something that I believed was true that was not true at all. Okay. And by that time, also doing the meditations, I was able to slowly, slowly, you know, chip a little bit away at some of the very gross aspects of my afflictions. So I had a little bit of confidence from my own experience that, yes, it's possible to, to chip away at these obscurations. 
okay? And these obscurations are not the nature of my mind. So it's possible if I keep chipping away, eventually, you know, can overcome them altogether. And then at that point, then there's no impediment to the mind knowing whatever thing, whatever exists. Because the mind, this nature is to know. And when there's no impediment to that knowing, then the mind can perceive things. So I went, oh, you know, that, that's how the Buddha can be omniscient. Yeah. That's how the Buddha is omniscient. So then, you know, that one quality of the Buddha, okay, it's possible to be omniscient. So yeah, there could be somebody who has that. So the, it's possible for the Buddha to exist. Yeah, are you following my reasoning here? Yeah, how I got there? But then the question was, okay, that's possible, but how do you get there? So, you know, again, for these questions, for me, it was very important to, for, to study the text and to, to learn from my teachers. You know, in those days, there were not very many English translations. So for me, the, the source of everything I knew was my teachers. And that's why I'm just so grateful to them. You know, it wasn't books. It wasn't tapes. It was live teachings. Yeah. So uh, I went to a teaching by Senchab Sirkam Rinpoche. Okay. Uh, he, his, the, the Sirkam Rinpoche that was my teacher was one of the Dalai Lama's tu tutors. Not a tutor, but his, de his debate partner. Okay. Sirkam Rinpoche passed away in the early 80s. He's now um, about, he's in his mid-30s now, yeah? So it's very interesting. You know somebody first when they're old, and then after time passes, you know them when they're young. Okay, but it's in a different lifetime. Anyway, the previous Sarkham Rinpoche, the, the one that was my teacher, he was teaching uh, the tantric paths and stages a text going through, uh, you know, the, the different stages of tantric practice and the different practices and how people uh, realized emptiness, how they developed serenity or shamatha. How, you know, uh, these, these teachings described how you could access a, an extremely subtle mind you know, the, the mind that's the clear light mind at death, and then use that mind to realize emptiness, the ultimate nature of how things, people and things exist. So when I heard this teaching where he really went into the details of here's the path, here are the stages laid out in sequence, yeah, I knew this practice was much too advanced for me where I am now, but it was a logical explanation that explained how our present body and mind can be used to attain the body, speech, and mind of a fully awakened one. So those teachings were like, wow, you know, it's like, okay, well, I didn't know such an explanation existed. And this really shows me a scientific path. Yeah. So that answered a lot of questions for me. Okay. So uh, you can see that for me, the whole thing of generating faith was, was very much based on learning the teachings themselves. Yeah. Now, that is not the way 
that's going to work for everybody. Okay. I think that if you uh, develop your faith through study, that it becomes um, study and reflection. I think your faith becomes more grounded because then if somebody asks you a question, you can give an answer that makes sense instead of, uh, you know, somebody says, well, who is this Buddha? And you go, uh, 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 he, um, he's that statue over there. Well, that's not a very convincing response for somebody. Okay. So, you know, that's the, the benefit because oh, other people will ask our, us questions. And we have to take their questions seriously and investigate and see if we can answer them. And if we don't know the answer to some of those questions, then it, it's showing us a, uh, a weakness in our own practice. Yeah, so we have to go and learn some more, understand some more, yeah, so that we really have a... a you know, a good view of what in the world we're doing. Yeah, because somebody is going to come along, maybe one of your old friends is going to come along. And, uh, you know, you start saying that you're going to Buddhist teachings. And they say, why in the world are you Buddhist? Yeah. Or maybe your mother and father say, oh, what, what are these Buddhists? What do they believe in? Yeah, well, what are you going to say? Yeah, do you do know? <laughs> okay, so this, this is where it, it's so helpful to learn and then discuss with other people and think about the teachings ourselves. Okay. But then, but, but all of that is not just intellectual learning. Yeah. It's, it may sound like, oh, you have to study, you have to listen to teaching. It's intellectual. It's not intellectual. Okay. Because when you really use the teachings that you're hearing as the lens to understand your own life experience, then it is not intellectual. You know, you begin to understand your, your own life experience. And you begin to understand, you know, kind of what you want to do with your life. What is important to do in life? Yeah. So it's, it's not just learning a bunch of facts and stuff like that. It's you think about it in, in terms of yourself. It's quite powerful. So some of the other, you know, there, there's certain moments when you're practicing that sometimes a feeling of faith comes in your mind. Uh, yeah, it could be that you've just kind of understood something that you read or that your teacher said something you didn't understand before and then somehow you know causes and conditions came together in your practice and it was like oh i get i understand that now and then that understanding leads to a feeling of faith okay so remember faith is this trusting mind it's this confident mind yeah so we want to develop uh, faith in the buddha dharma sangha but they also talk about having faith in our teachers yeah, and our teachers are human beings, or at least they sure look that way. 
How do you develop faith in your teachers? Well, yeah, when you hang around Buddhist centers, you'll see a whole divergency of how people develop faith and what kind of faith it is. Okay. Some people, it's like my teacher's really good looking. I have faith. My teacher has a really good sense of humor. I have faith. My teacher pays attention to me more, a little bit more than to the other students. So I have faith. My teacher, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama teaches, my teacher sits up on the stage and his seat is a little bit higher than the seats of all the other lamas sitting on the stage. That's my teacher, the one in the higher seat. Okay, I am not lying when I give you these examples. I have seen this, okay? And His Holiness tells the story. He's so funny. He says <laughs> that when they, they set up the seats, uh, you know, in Dharamsala, His Holiness has a big throne, and then there's a stage, and they set the seats of the high lamas on the stage. And <laughs> He, he tells a story. I don't know if this happened in old Tibet or if it happened here in Dharamsala. But he was saying some disciples really like their teachers a lot. So after the seats are set up, they go in and put some extra cushions under their teacher's place so that their teacher is sitting higher. Yeah. And then they could say, that's my teacher. Yeah. And then I've met people who go, my teachers realized emptiness. I know for sure. Yeah. When he teaches about emptiness, his eyes tear up. I think he's a bodhisattva. And then it turns out to be somebody who's quite controversial but they can't even see that, okay? So this is not the way to develop a good relationship with a spiritual mentor. This is not the way to cultivate faith in a spiritual mentor, okay? So it's, um, you have to get to know the person and you have to observe them. And you have to observe because the, the sutras, the, uh, the text by Maitreya, the Sutra Alankara, talks about the qualities of a, uh, a, an expert Mahayana teacher. Yeah, there's 10 qualities. So you have to learn what those qualities are and then check people out. Do they have those qualities? Yeah. It's hard to find somebody with all 10 qualities. So they say, okay, then settle for five. That's good, you know. But at least a teacher should have more knowledge than you do. They should have a good motivation, one of compassion, that, that has our, our best interests, our spiritual interests in, uh, you know, as, as important. They should be patient. And they should know what they're talking about and not make up their own teachings and then call it the Buddha Dharma. Okay, so those are just some very basic things to look for. Um, and also somebody who has good ethical conduct. My goodness, you know, there's enough scandals. We don't want to get involved in any of those. So we have to check up 
on the teacher and get to know them. Yeah. And, and see if there's somebody who really inspires us to practice and somebody whose teachings we can trust, whose compassion we can trust, you know, and somebody who's not going to like, because as students, we make a lot of mistakes, okay? And sometimes we are positively obnoxious. Um, so we need teachers that are not, you know, when we're in one of our obnoxious moods, who are not going to go, you know, like get that person away, throw them out. I don't, you know, I can't stand them again. Yeah, you don't want a teacher who's going to turn around and do that to you. So watch how they treat people, okay? But uh, so developing faith or confidence or trust in a teacher, yeah, really involves uh, examining them quite well. And not just, uh, his, again, His Holiness, <laughs> he says, some people pick their teachers based on how many titles they have. And he says, when those same people are in India, maybe they're just an ordinary monk. But when they go abroad to Singapore, or to the West, all of a sudden, they have so many titles. You know, his eminence, the venerable Tulku, so-and-so, Rinpoche, uh, Dorji Chong, the fifth, you know, some like long title. And his name is just one of those words. But the rest are all a bunch of titles that either his students have, have given him, yeah, or that he has given himself. So his holiness says, that is, oops, that is not the good criteria for picking a teacher, the number of titles. Also, he says, the height of the throne, that is not the criteria, who has the highest throne, okay? Who has the most brocade, yeah? Because some of the lamas wear brocade or their throne, their seats have brocade or whatever. Um, that's not indicative of somebody who's really qualified how much brocade they have. Okay. And he says, you have to look for the qualities and then and then check out if it if it you know feels right to you. And there may be a very good llama, but you don't have that connection with that person. That's fine. Yeah. Somebody else, one of your friends may have devotion towards one person, but it just doesn't click with you. That's okay. Yeah. But you when you, to develop some kind of uh, trust and confidence so that we allow ourselves to be receptive and learn from that person, then we, you know, we have to kind of observe, observe them in action, so to speak, you know. And His Holiness said, check out what they're teaching, and is what they're teaching the general Buddhist explanation? Yeah, or are they mixing it in with some other stuff? or exaggerating this side or negating that side so that what they're teaching is, you know, it sounds good, but it's not the Buddha's teaching. Okay. So now in this supermarket uh, of spiritual practices that we have in all of our countries now, doesn't matter East or West, um, you know, this is this is uh, upon us to to check out, yeah, and uh, and then when we check out somebody's qualities, then it becomes easy to trust them, easy to have confidence in them. Okay, 
it's kind of like, you know, if you're going to marry somebody, you want to know them. Yeah. It's like just because they're good looking and you had a good first date doesn't mean you're going to jump in bed with them and marry them and live with them happily ever after. Yeah. You have to get to know people. So it's the same way with a spiritual teacher. You get to know them in a very different way, not in the same way. You, you get to know a romantic partner. You know, it's a different way. But the, the idea is, you know, that we, we have to know them and trust them. Yeah. Okay. So I think there's hopefully a little bit of time for Q&A, or at least the Q part. I don't know about the answers. And I hope that somehow by using some, these examples, it's given you some idea of, of ways to, to build faith. But also everybody is, is different. Yeah. So don't have a cookie cutter mentality of, okay, I've got to do it exactly this way. Yeah. Okay. So you can raise your hand or you can put your question in the chat box, is it? Yes, okay. correct. Uh, Venerable, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, how is there like a checkpoint in, in our practices to know whether we are moving on the right track? You mean how to, to check our practice to see if we're advancing? Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, one way is if you are understanding the teachings better now than you did before. Yeah. We may uh, hear, you know, we often hear the same teaching, the same text, many, many times, but if we're understanding it at a different level, then, you know, there's some progress there, okay? And so you can see that, you know, as you do purification practices, as you uh, create merit, yeah, then your teacher explains something that you've heard 15 times already, uh, or maybe even once or twice. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, I get it. Or you see it, you see something in yourself that you haven't been able to see before, or you see some way that you need to direct yourself to uh, build up certain qualities or diminish certain faults, and you begin to see that in yourself, then you're, you're making progress. Okay. So don't expect like abracadabra fancy things to happen to know that you're going in the right direction. Okay. I, I went one time to Putoshan. Have any of you been to Putoshan? This is a uh, Chenrezig's holy site. Uh, in, uh, in China. And there was one place uh, on one side of the island uh, that had a cave. And they said that people went there and had visions of Kuan Yin. So um, we were going to all the different places and we went to that one place and we're standing in the, in the room. It was like, yeah, kind of a room in a cave or something. And there, there were some other people there, too. And the other people, oh, it was so cute. They were standing a little bit in front of us. Like, oh, there's Kuan Yin. Yeah. Oh, look, she's looking at us. That's so nice. There's Kuan Yin. We're seeing Kuan Yin. And so this went on for a few minutes. And then I said, oh, OK, Kuan Yin, you must be getting tired now. Uh, we'll leave, we'll excuse ourselves. And they left. Yeah. So it was, it was so sweet, you know. Now, did they really see Kuan Yin? I have no idea. Okay. 
but I did not compare myself to them. So that was progress. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Because I know by now that seeing Kuan Yin does not necessarily mean my practice is advancing. Okay. Because you can have all sorts of unusual experiences. Yeah. And you can think you see Kuan Yin, but maybe it's not actually Kuan Yin. Maybe it's your mind dreaming something up. Okay. So I, I went to that same place. I didn't see Kuan Yin. The lady who was there at the same time saw Kuan Yin. I'm gone. I don't see anything. But in my heart, I have a lot of faith and trust in Kuan Yin. I have a lot of admiration for her. I want to become like her. And so I think that is more valuable in our practice. Thank you, Venerable. I have a question from Alan Stoker. His question is, where would I be able to find the 10 qualities to look for in the Buddhist teacher? Okay. If uh, uh, there's a series of texts called The Library of Wisdom and Compassion, in volume two of that series, volume two is called The Foundation of Buddhist Practice. There are some chapters on how to relate to the spiritual mentor. And so those 10 qualities are listed in that chapter. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have another question. Mm, where should I go seek a teacher? Especially for a person with a family responsibilities, how can he or she seek a teacher? Okay. So when you seek a teacher, it's, it, it doesn't have to be a big deal. Okay. If you live in a place where there are Buddhist centers, uh, you go to teachings, yeah? Or uh, maybe you live in a place where there aren't Buddhist centers. There's plenty of material online. You listen to teachings online. Or what's even better is you travel, yeah? You find a teacher. Uh, you know, you look at the description of, of the teacher and then what the retreat is on or the course. And then you travel and you go to where they are and you listen to the teachings. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a big production. Yeah. You just go and you listen and you, and you know, you really listen and, to, and you try and take the teachings in. And, you know, how, are these teachings, you know, really hitting my heart? Yeah. So it, it's, it's not a thing. You know, some people think, oh, yeah, you go to teachings. Very first teaching, I sit down, the teacher comes in, I get goosebumps just seeing my teacher. I know he's got to be realized. And then they sit down and they teach and tears start flowing down my eyes because I know that I had a connection with them in my last life. I have so much devotion and faith. <sighs> Give me a break, okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I've seen this kind of thing, not quite as dramatic as I made it, but somewhat dramatic, okay? Um, no, you, you just, you listen, you observe, you take the teachings in, you think about them, you know? Another thing that is, and you go back a few times, unless the teacher just like turns you off and you, you have some weird vibe, you know, then maybe you don't go back. Also, another thing to look at is what are the other students like? Because if you become a student of that teacher, 
then you'll become somewhat like the other students. So check what they're like, if they're the kind of people that are, you know, good role models for you. Okay. And so you, you just go and listen and do your practice. And, um, you know, for me, when I started, I had no idea of anything. I didn't know anything about Buddhism. I didn't know the difference between Buddhism and Hinduism or the Theravada and Mahayana. I didn't know anything. But the one thing that I did know was what these people said made sense. And when I thought about it and practiced it, it helped me in my life. And so they... I just kept going back for more. I never went and said, will you be my teacher? You know, I just kept going back for more and more teachings because what I was hearing was totally incredible, you know? So, it, it, you know, it was a very kind of organic process. And then in Tibetan Buddhism, you can have more than one teacher. So my, my two principal teachers started recommending other teachers for me to go to. I don't think it was because they really wanted to get rid of me. Um, but, you know, they, they recommended other teachers uh, who wound up to be equally as incredible. Yeah. Thank you. And when I, say, when I say incredible, I don't mean, you know, they levitated or they, uh, you know, fire came out or not, no. When I, when I say incredible, I mean that what they taught was, was very powerful for changing the mind. Okay. Other questions? Thank you, Venerable. Um, Cindy has a question. Cindy, would you like to unmute yourself and you can ask Venerable directly? Yes, hello, Venerable. Thank you for your teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the pleasure of meeting at a TBC training years ago in Singapore. And mm -hmm. I also am a Westerner and coming late into Buddhism in my life. I'm kind of interested to know how important you think speaking Tibetan quite well or even fluently is important to the practice because you've used a few Tibetan words and I'm, I'm curious to know how, how deeply into that uh, language you've, you've dove. Okay, well, you are hitting on my biggest failure. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Truly, <laughs> my biggest failure is that I never learned Tibetan. I, uh, I have many reasons why. Because I didn't have a visa. When I had a visa, I didn't have a teacher. When I had a teacher and a visa, I had hepatitis. When, I mean, I, yeah, there were so many reasons. I tried. Yeah. But it just, I just... The, the causes and conditions weren't there. It, I think it depends how uh, on your particular interest and disposition. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, study the text directly and go into the philosophy deeply, then knowing Tibetan is very, very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you know, now there's becoming more translations of some of those texts. Some of them are difficult to understand, but if the translation is difficult, the original Tibetan is also hard to understand. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but some people want to read it in the, in the original language. So in that way, uh, I think it can be very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have to know Tibetan in order to progress on the path? Uh, the Buddha didn't know Tibetan. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 
it's not like you have like speaking Tibetan is a prerequisite for gaining realizations. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. What I managed to learn was some of the terminology, mm. which I found very helpful because then when I'm listening to teachings, at least I can know the subject they're talking about. Mm-hmm. But uh, cl- uh, classical Tibetan and colloquial Tibetan are, are like two different languages. Mm. Yeah. So Understood. quite different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Anything else? Um, thank you, Venerable. I have another question from... Okay. Right, his name is uh, Willie. Willie Sechek. If, um, if I pronounce the name wrongly, I'm sorry. As you move along the path, does trusting mean you absolutely have to believe in what the teacher says? Or can you still have doubts like one does at the beginning? What if the teachers have different interpretations of texts such as what constitutes sexual misconduct, intoxicants, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so having doubts about, I, I couldn't catch everything about the explanation of things such as those particular precepts. Yes. Yeah. So what, what he says is, as we move along the path, that's trusting means you absolutely have to believe in whatever the teacher says. Or no. You, you can still have some <laughs> doubts like, uh, like in the beginning, before we step into the path of uh, Buddhism, so we have doubts, right? So yeah. or we still can have such doubts. Okay. What, uh, again, I'm quoting His Holiness here. He always says, you don't just believe what the teacher says. You have to take it and examine it using reasoning and logic. Okay. Not skepticism. You don't want to sit there and increase your doubts and your skepticism, like, ah, uh, you make me believe that. That's not going to help you, you know, at all. But we should examine everything the teacher says and everything the Buddha says, because that's the only way that we can determine for ourselves, you know, if this is true and how to integrate it in our own mind. Yeah. So we should question. And doubts, yes, doubts come up. You, it, there's different kind of doubts. There's the doubt of, gee, I have this question, and I wonder how these things fit together and how this works, and how do I practice that? And like, that's a good kind of doubt. You know, you're curious, you want to learn. The kind of doubt that is not so good is, what is this guy saying anyway? You know, do they really think I'm going to believe that nonsense? Yeah, this kind of, where you're arrogant, you know, you're basically arrogant and skeptical. So you're not really receptive. Yeah. So when we get, when our mind gets like that, then we're blocking ourselves. We're becoming our own worst enemy. Yeah. But we should check. You hear things. Okay. So, you know, regarding the interpretations, the the person gave the example of uh, the interpretation of sexual misconduct and of intoxicants. Okay. If you, uh, If you hear a traditional Tibetan Lama explain, for example, the third precept about sexual behavior, and he is a traditional Lama, he's going to follow Vasubandhu and say all these things uh, that if you are a, uh, you know, I don't know how to describe, if, you know, in, in our time, in our day and age, these things are not the common social values. Yeah, they worked in Vasubandhu's time, but the social values are very different in in our time. Yeah, so you can understand that for that precept. Okay, they're explaining it according to the text, 
But in that particular precept, then there's some wiggle room because it depends very much on the society that you're speaking of, okay? So for example, in Tibetan uh, society, there was um, not, what's it called when you have many husbands? Polyandry. Polyandry, okay? Polyandry. So a woman had many husbands. Yeah, this is in old Tibet. And it was part of their social system because that way the family property all uh, stayed together. Yeah, because all the kids were the kids of the various brothers or whoever it was that was their father. So it kept the property together. In our culture, now I know Chinese culture, there is not polyandry, but polygamy, polygamy, where a man can have many wives, okay? But then in modern culture, uh, that doesn't go over so well. What's the law in Singapore? Is it legal to have more than one spouse? No. Okay, yeah. Here, also in the U.S., it's not legal. Some countries, it may be legal or it may be part of their culture. Yeah. So these kind of things depend on the place. And so you have to assess that. When the teacher teaches about emptiness, for example, the ultimate nature of things, then you really have to exert yourself and try and understand what they're talking about. Because if you, and you come up with a lot of questions and those questions are good because as you seek answers, your understanding will deepen, okay? But the answers to those questions are not gonna depend on culture, okay? Okay, so I think we have to stop now. And- uh, And Rebel, do we have yeah? one, do you have time for one more question from Facebook? Okay. All right, so we have a question from um, Bung Liang. This question uh -huh. is, um, okay. How to differentiate between true faith and superstition? It, what was the first one? To true Second faith. One, true faith and tradition. And superstition. 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 Yes. Superstition and tradition. And no. Wait a minute, how many things are you asking me to, to, to discuss? Okay. So let me repeat his question. Okay. His question is how to differentiate between true faith and superstition. Okay, true faith and superstition. No tradition. Okay. <laughs> um, whether it's, it's based on reasoning and logic. Yeah, whether it makes sense, whether you can explain it to yourself in a way that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, if it's superstition, it's likely to sound... Uh, okay, let me approach it this way. When I first came to Singapore in 19... 87, okay? Buddhism was very different in Singapore than it is now. And so the young people who came, uh, what they thought, they knew a little bit about Buddhism, but what they considered Buddhism basically was ancestor worship. And what, what in Singapore you call Taoism. You know, you go to the temple and you throw the sticks uh, you know, to get an answer. You burn paper money for your relatives, these kinds of things, okay? I always found it very cu curious that people uh, bought money from the bank of hell and then burned that so their relatives would get it as if they were assuming their relatives were in hell. I found that quite interesting, yeah? Um, but anyway... Okay, so you start to learn, and you're like, 
oh, is that a Buddhist practice? You know, because when I first went to Singapore, I stayed in a temple and they had effigies in the middle of the, of the hall. And, you know, the food set out. I, I came in the seventh month. So you people know Singapore in the seventh month, you know? Okay. So, um, yeah. So people were asking me about that. And, you know, you do some research and, oh, that's ancestor worship. Okay. Now, people may want to worship their ancestors. That's okay. From a Buddhist viewpoint, chances are your ancestors have already been reborn. Yeah. And some may be in hell, but hopefully some of them aren't. And even if you, if some of them are in hell, burning the paper money is not going to make them rich in hell. Okay. And burning a paper car and a paper computer, they're not going to get it. Okay. So, you know, you do some research and some study and you see, okay, that's ancestor worship. It could be, you know, kind of mixed in with superstition. Uh, but, you know, Buddhist practice is, is something different than that. Does that make some sense to the person who asked the question? Whoever you are. Oh, Venerable, okay. I think he is on Facebook. So, um, oh, okay. so he's asking a question from Facebook. Uh, do we okay. have time for one more question from the yeah. floor? We have Sunil who raised his hand. Okay, one, one more question. And then, because it's getting late here. You're Thank in you. the morning. Yeah, you're in morning. Here it's evening. <laughs> Thank you so much for your teaching. It's, it's an honor listening to you. Um, I have a very quick question. Um, I live in U.S. And because of COVID and restrictions, there's, it's hard to go listen to somebody. It's, and I have... Uh, comorbid family members that puts more restrictions on traveling. Um, my question is, for someone with family background and just a normal common person who mm -hmm. late in his life got interested in Buddhist philosophy because of certain life experiences. And I have been reading, thanks to your translations and a lot of good books that I that have come up. I've been trying to learn as much as I can by reading books, listening to YouTube or wisdom publications, and there there are a lot of online resources. What would be your advice as to for someone like me trying to practice Buddhism with all the limitations that I have? with family life and mm -hmm. this is the first time I'm getting a chance to ask these questions to somebody I respect. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. It's a very good question, Sunil. Thank you for asking it. Um, the, some of the things you can find on, on, uh, Online are guided meditations, yeah, that you can go to. Of course, you're going to want to look at, look for Buddhist guided meditations. Um, I did a book called, they just changed the title. The original title was Guided Meditations on the Stages of the Path. And then they reprinted it. I think it's called Buddhist meditations, guided Buddhist. Gui guided Buddhist meditations. And so within the book, there's the outline of some of the meditations to do that match the, uh, the readings from the stages of the path. And there's also a, uh, a, a URL that links to those same meditations when they are online. And so you can 
uh, downloaded or listened to the guided meditations live, okay? We recorded them and so you can listen to people doing, you know, what rules me. So, um, you know, leading the meditations. And so that is a very good way to start because uh, it's a series of meditations and you go through this series and so you're guided so you can see how different topics that the Buddha taught uh, fit together, you know, in your life. So that's a good way to start. And then you learn through uh, starting with the guided meditations, then you learn how to make your own meditation outlines when you read something. So then the readings you do, you can go through and uh, you know pick out the important points and then think about them one by one by one. Another way is uh, we're a, um, we're about to start at Shravasti Abbey what we call the retreat from afar, and so yeah. every year uh, the Abbey monastics do a three month retreat on a certain practice. And uh, then people who aren't living with us uh, can do one session of the practice. So you could spend, you know, a half an hour on the practice or an hour. Or you could do it really quickly. But we send uh, the people the text with the step by step how you do it. And then each week, um, you know, you can go online and get a teaching that explains the practice a little bit more, okay? So that's also a way if you wanna start a meditation practice. So if you go to our website, um, yes. yeah, you can okay. find it, okay? Yeah. That, I mentioned the thank safe you. program. What? The safe program. Oh yeah. And then we also have another program called Shravasti Abbey Friends Education or SAFE. And uh, that's a program that's run yeah. twice a year. Some of the people who are on the call, I recognize them from the safe class. Uh, but it's, it's a, a, a way of, uh, you have certain readings and things you listen to each week and then certain meditations that you do. And then there's a facilitator who helps guide you. So that's, that's something too, that's on our website as well. Thank okay. you so much. Sure, thank you. Okay, so we're going to close now. There's probably more questions, um, but having questions is good. Yeah, uh, so just keep learning and exploring and thinking about the answers that you hear. Okay, so let's take a minute. Yeah. Um, and let's just sit together for a minute and really rejoice that we have been able to share the evening like this. Well, or the morning for you. <laughs> and rejoice at the, the merit, the positive potential, the good energy that we created as individuals, and also the merit of the entire group working together, trying to develop our compassion and wisdom. And then let's send all of that goodness out into the universe. Due to this merit, may we soon attain the awakened state of Guru Buddha, that we may be able to liberate all sentient beings from their suffering. May the precious Bodhi mind not yet born arise and grow. May the born have no decline but increase forevermore. OK, 
Okay. Thank you very much. Those of you in Singapore, you have a very good teacher at uh, Tibetan Buddhist Center, Geshe Yantun is very good. Take advantage of him and go to teachings. Yeah. Or if, I don't know, maybe he's doing things on Zoom now. So yeah, take advantage of that. All right, participants, you may like to unmute yourself and thank Venerable yourself. Thank you, Venerable. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Happy Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. Happy New Year. Enjoy, Enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Thank you so much. Good night.